and move to our next presentation, which is strategies, strategies to improve recruitment and retention of special education staff. And Sahara Monahan, when you're ready, please proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I am Sahara Monahan, Senior Performance Auditor at the Office of the Washington State Auditor. This performance audit identified strategies to help school districts improve recruitment and retention of special education staff. It is the first in a series of studies the office plans to conduct on special education. Future studies will examine the prevalence of students with disabilities in non-public agencies that provide a special education services. I would like to thank OSPI and the school districts that participated in this study for the information and assistance they provided. Some background, Washington has almost 150,000 students, students with disabilities who are eligible for the special education services. These students have unique social, emotional, and functional needs that can affect their ability to learn. A special education teachers, paraeducators, and specialists play a critical role in providing these students with the special education services that they need to achieve educational goals. These services can include lessons to develop basic life or study skills, a speech or physical therapy, behavior management, and vocational education, among other services. In brief, we found that Washington lacks qualified special education staff, but does not know the full extent of the shortage and attrition in the field. The school districts we spoke to describe multiple challenges they face with recruiting and retaining qualified special education staff, including unfavorable working conditions, inability to pay competitive wages, the quality of preparation programs, and other community factors. A school districts may be able to improve recruitment and retention practices, but they will need the support of their regional and statewide educational agencies to do so. We identified various practices that can help school districts strengthen their recruitment and retention efforts. We conducted this audit because having an adequate and a stable supply of qualified special education staff is critical to helping students with disabilities achieve their educational goals. However, like most states, Washington educational agencies report shortages in turnover or of qualified staff. These shortfall hampers school district's ability to recruit and retain the qualified personnel that they need to address student needs. The audit objective was to identify opportunities to help school districts strengthen recruitment and retention of special education staff. This included identifying effective recruitment and retention strategies, as well as considering the challenges that school districts face on those efforts in ways that school districts can collaborate with key partners, such as the Regional Educational Service Districts and OSPI, to implement recommended approaches. Multiple research studies and school districts report shortages of qualified special education staff. Here are some statistics on what the situation looks like for special education teachers. The number of job vacancies for special education teachers is three times larger than that of elementary education teachers, and it's almost twice as high in rural and high poverty districts compared to urban in low poverty districts. The statewide share of special education instruction that is provided by teachers who lack an endorsement or who only have a limited certificate in special education is three times larger than the next highest content area, which is elementary education. SPED teachers, nearly 30% of them have less than five years of experience. These teachers have also left the profession at a rate of 6 to 8% annually over the past two decades. Complicating the matter further is that the vacancy and turnover rate that I just mentioned 
may be greater than the state knows. This is because Washington does not systematically collect and analyze school district data on vacant positions. Also, because existing estimates of special education teacher turnover only account for those teachers that have left the profession. It doesn't account for special education teachers that move within and across the school districts. The lack of this information matters because it makes it more difficult for the state to identify the specific school districts that have the most severe staffing needs in order to deploy resources accordingly to address the shortfall. As school districts we spoke to describe various challenges they face in recruiting and retaining special education staff, including unfavorable working conditions, which are driven by heavy student caseloads and administrative responsibilities that go beyond the duties of general education teachers, as well as lack of leadership support. Districts that are located, located near each other sometimes find themselves competing for the same candidates, which leaves a smaller districts that cannot afford to pay higher wages at a disadvantage. The quality of preparation, teacher preparation programs, when it's not adequate, can also leave the teachers unprepared for the job and result in turnover. Various community factors also pose barriers to recruitment and retention. For example, some school districts are in locations that are remote, expensive, or lack housing, have few to no special education preparation programs in their community, and may have been limited by credentialing barriers that prevented the hiring of qualified teachers with out-of-state endorsements or certificates. The problem of a lack of qualified special education staff with its adverse effect on students cannot be solved by the school districts alone. However, a partnership between school districts, regional educational service districts, and OSPI can provide a path forward to addressing most challenges. In the next few slides, I'm going to provide an overview of five comprehensive strategies that experts recommend to improve recruitment and retention of special education staff in ways that educational agencies can uh, work together to implement the recommended approaches. Alternative routes to certification and grow your own programs can help school districts attract and prepare people to become special education teachers. As studies have found that when this programs provide comprehensive coursework and a strong mentorship and support, they can result in special education teachers of the same quality as those that are trained in traditional programs. Creating these alternative preparation programs requires action and support from all educational partners. One particular partner action I would like to highlight here is how OSPI can help develop a list of grant opportunities to help support school districts in creating these programs. In the 2024 legislative session, the legislature passed a bill to allow Washington to join the Interstate Teacher Mobility Compact, which is already in place in another 11 states. This agreement provides greater flexibility to school districts by allowing them to hire qualified uh, teachers with out-of-state endorsements and certificates without requiring that these candidates complete additional state-specific exams or coursework. Since this bill was just recently passed, one way OSBI can help school districts is by developing and disseminating guidance to help districts understand how these changes impact how they hire teachers with out-of-state endorsements and certificates. Wages and other forms of comp compensation underpin many decisions about where people decide to work and under what conditions they're willing to persevere. Experts recommend three financial incentive strategies to help attract people to the special education profession. These include differentiated pay structures, contingency-based incentives such as scholarships and fellowships, and then paying for tu or, or paying for tuition costs. There are two partner actions that I would like to highlight here. 
First, OSPI could develop a funding proposal to adopt a statewide differentiated pay structures that will offer more compensation to special education teachers that decide to work in areas of critical shortage, such as districts that are located in rural, high crime, or high poverty areas. Hawaii implemented this initiative and has had significant success. The state reported that this initiative has resulted in a 45% reduction in the number of special education vacancies and a 43% increase in the number of teachers that either entered or transferred to the special education field. Second, school districts can consult with their budget offices and bargaining units to determine if they can provide additional compensation to special education teachers under certain conditions. For example, staff at the Olympia school districts said that their bargaining contract allows them to provide additional compensation to special education teachers for two issues, for writing individualized education programs for students and also if a teacher's caseload exceeds 25 students. The workload for special education teachers can be particularly challenging. In addition to the regular duties that all teachers have, they also have additional time consuming but essential, essential responsibilities such as writing and managing a student's individualized education program and coordinating with multiple staff such as paraeducators and specialists that are involved in helping deliver services to students. Research should suggest three approaches to help a school district promote manageable workloads. This includes establishing a specific student caseloads, providing administrative support, and clarifying roles. All educational partners can take steps to help promote manageable workloads. One particular action I would like to highlight here is how school districts can examine existing resources and staffing assignments to determine if changes can be made to their process to their processes to alleviate heavy workloads for special education teachers. For example, Lopez Island and OMAC school district redistributed or hire an additional support person to help special education teachers with administrative tasks. A school district leaderships can help retain a special education staff by promoting supportive workplace environments. Supportive workplaces provide a strong induction and mentoring to help special education teachers feel acclimated and effective in their role. They offer ongoing professional learning opportunities to help um, special education teachers continue to improve their skills and bring the practices that they learn back into the classroom. Supportive workplaces also offer special education teachers and staff uh, an opportunity to provide input into decisions that affect their work and appropriate recognition for their contributions to the, sp to the school. Again, all educational partners can help promote supportive workplace environments. One particular partner action I would like to highlight in this area is how regional educational service districts can consider hosting one or more experienced special education teachers to serve as mentors for small districts in the region that, cannot, that lack the staff or cannot afford to hire a staff to serve on a mentor role. To conclude, several, several other states have um, implemented the strategies I just highlighted to strengthen their recruitment and retention efforts. We encourage Washington school districts, regional educational service districts, and OSPI to consider these strategies to help attract and retain the qualified personnel that is needed to help students with disabilities meet educational goals. This concludes the presentation. Here is our contact information, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Uh, we also have some staff uh, 
from uh, from OSPI that I understand is available, as well as somebody from the East Valley School District. Uh, do any of those folks want to make comments uh, on the report? Uh, hello, and thank you very much. For the record, my name is Nicholas Gillen. I work at OSPI under Assistant Superintendent Tanya May in the Special Education Division. I've had the opportunity to work with SAO throughout this process and have appreciated their uh, thoughtfulness and their timely feedback and their thoughtful processes as they put this all together. Um, we don't have formal remarks to make, although we did submit some written remarks and we um, had the opportunity to be collaborative revisers, partners in revision on an initial draft. Uh, so, as, as we were asked to, you know, consider these recommendations, we thoughtfully do and very much appreciate them. They are, uh, many of them in alignment with several of the recommendations that we have as well for uh, districts, ESDs, partners, and ourselves as the agency. So, I'll make myself available for questions and uh, provide my colleague from OSPI an opportunity to say hello as well. Thank you so much, um, Makachniski, with OSPI as, as well. Um, again, just wanted to say we, we appreciate the work um, of, the, of this report, and again, really take these recommendations to heart. Uh, we, we appreciate them. Happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you for your comments. Um, I don't see anyone else wishing to make a comment, so we will go to questions, and we will start with Representative Paulette. Thank you. Um, uh, I've been eagerly looking forward to this audit, and I want to thank the State Auditor's Office for uh, the, uh, not just for this audit, but the great attention that the Auditor's Office is paying to the uh, crisis we have with uh, public schools and the special education um, Staffing, funding, provision of services. Um, appreciate your looking at the full range of issues involved and the prevalence of disabilities as part of that. Um, uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, let me, I'll ask one and then stop and let you, the chair, ask other people and then like to ask to be able to return for a question. Um, but. The first question I have is, if a district negotiates funding increase for special ed certificate, certificated teachers based on a caseload, as the example you provided us, does the state offer any additional support for uh, meeting that caseload limitation or does that funding simply come out of the district's pocket under the prototypical school funding formula or out of their levy money? And uh, similarly, um, in terms of addressing the caseload problem, uh, did you look at and have any recommendations about the formula that currently provides solely one paraeducator for a prototypical uh, elementary school when the paraeducators are the incredibly dedicated frontline staff people working with students with disabilities every day and supporting those special ed certificated educators. Okay, to answer your first question, this particular school district use local levy funds to bargain uh, for that additional compensation that is provided when a teacher's caseload is, exceeds 25 students or for them to write um, individualized education programs for students. Based on the limited work we did in this audit, um, I am not aware of other support that the state is providing to help um, the districts uh, promote manageable workloads. And one of the actions, uh, part of what, which, why one of the actions in the report is for um, 
OSPI to consider developing statewide guidelines um, on criteria for establishing student caseloads or workload caps to, so that the districts can use that um, to help promote manageable workloads. Many uh, other states educational agencies have develop these um, guidelines on student caseload or workload caps to help with this um, issue of um, heavy workloads and promote manageable workloads. Um, <clears throat> your second question, in this area we did not look at the formula that you were talking about, um, but one thing that I remember hearing from a few of the school districts is that one of the criteria they use to determine if a teacher needs um, additional para educator support is you know how many students have and what level of support that students needs need. So that kind of like helped them determine like if a special education teacher needs like one or two para educators, but we did not examine the particular formula that you are talking about. Yeah. So Representative Berg. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. And I think I'm gonna be like Rep. Paulette, have a couple of questions, we can bounce back and forth. Um, first, I just wanted to thank you for this report because um, I was looking forward to it as well. And it's very, very informative. I wanted to, I guess my first question would be kind of based on what Rep. Paulette brought up on the caseload management. And so I think it was on page, well, anyway, it was on um, I think page 13. And when you talked about that, you identified some districts that you felt like had implemented successful strategies around that. And you mentioned, I believe, Lopez Island and OMAC. Were the, the, those, um, lo, those are two examples. Th those are two, and I just, and I, it was, it piqued my interest because I, I believe, if memory serves, those are two districts that have um, parent partnerships that are rather robust. And so this may be a question for you or for uh, OSPI, and it's good to see you, Mikhail, and um, always great to see OSPI, but it, it has, was there found any connection between robust parent partnership programs at districts and the ability of a district to pivot and potentially support things like additional um, uh, educators or paras for special ed? Um, this district didn't like provide that kind of detail. Unfortunately, I don't I don't have that detail. But um, I believe one of them, um, if I remember correctly, said that they reexamined their um, resources and assignments and were able to like redistribute some of the administrative um, task of a special education teachers to a current uh, support person that was already at the district. The other one higher a support person to be able to provide assistance to um, a special education teachers with the administrative task. Sorry, I can't, yeah. yeah. No, and I think so, and I think that's a great answer. And just, if I can just follow up on that same line of thought. So OSPI, do you, have you found, um, as you look through reports like this in your interaction with uh, various special ed programs at various districts, is there uh, any type of connection between robust parent partnerships and additional support that districts are able to provide for special ed? Hello, and thank you. I'd be happy to speak on this, although I am not um, certainly uh, the definitive voice on this. So um, we have done several efforts and initiatives, and I wanna just, if I may, make a couple of background comments before answering your question. So. I am funded on a federal grant from the Office of uh, Special Education Programs that is about recruitment and retention of special educators in Washington. It's a multi-year grant. And in this, we've partnered with uh, districts, with uh, uh, ESDs and with other uh, preparation program partners and others for the past few years and developed a set of recommendations that, like I said, uh, overlap very many of what we've heard today. In that work, we have examined how and in what ways can parent partnerships in districts support recruitment and retention. So that is more broad than your question about caseload caps. The, it, my opinion on this is that there, there is an operative connection, although I haven't seen any study of it per se. So what can happen is when there are robust parent partnerships and wraparound programs, I'll give Medical Lake as an example, Medical Lake School District, when there are these wraparound 
supports that parents can help provide, it can alleviate some of the pressure on a special education teacher to try to be everything for all students. So parent partnerships can support certainly uh, special education teachers and then retention. Thank you. So I so I have a couple of questions too, and it's also on slide 13, and it has to do with uh, the caseload and workload caps. Um, first of all, the wording of this leaves me a little bit confused because it says to develop a state uh, develop statewide guidelines for establishing uh, caseload and workload caps. That means that doesn't necessarily mean the state is setting what those caps or, or uh, on caseloads would be, it means you're creating some guidelines on what they should be. But my concern about this is what is the liability of the state or of a school district if, these, if caps are set? And let me just give you an example, small school district has five special ed students and the cap is five. Another small school district has six and the cap is five. That means they need two special ed teachers to serve six students. You're telling me that we're having trouble recruiting and retaining people. What if that school district can't get that second staff person? Especially if they're a rural school district you have trouble getting people out into those rural areas. It's the liability on that school district. What is, I mean, are, are there gonna be services lost? That one student is now not going to get services? Or is there going to be a lawsuit against the state? Is there gonna be a lawsuit against the district? What happens in that situation? Um, part of the reason why it says develop guidelines is because student case loads are going to vary based on various factors. The number of students can vary based on various factors. The number of students, the grade level, the severity of uh, their, their disabilities, and the level of support that the students need. So the guidelines are important to help the school districts kind of assess all of those variables, but there needs to be, based on the studies, there needs to be flexibility on what that cap is, depending on what that, um, um, the needs of the students on that school or teacher's caseload. So it's, it's not gonna be like something set if the students on the mix change, to where another special education teacher or more para-educator support is needed. So there needs to be flexibility. It's more about like providing guidelines so that they can help set some um, cap. But those caps needs to be flexible depending on the mix of the students in there. So you've entered another variable in there, which I was considering, and that's the acuity level. Uh, the, the needs of uh, the students can vary tremendously yes. within this category. Um, so I'm, I'm still wondering, are we, you, you say the caps are flexible, then are they really caps or are they just guidelines for what, for what caseload should be rather than caps? Because I'm, I'm a little worried that if we do a hard cap and say, you know, you, you can only have five students at this combination of acuity, or if you do a, a point system and you can only have students that total up to a certain point level of acuity and that's the cap, what happens if we go one point beyond that? Um, what happens you know, to that school district that is struggling um, to retain their, their teacher now and then they get that one more uh, student that puts them over the cap? especially in these small rural school districts. What is the liability on those school districts of this potential policy? Their guidelines to primarily help a school district assess when additional um, 
special education teachers or para educator support is needed to support that teachers that have a mix of the students with complex complex needs on um, on their workload. So you know, you can play around with the term, but there are guidelines um, to help a school districts kind of assess workload, redistribute workloads to make it more manageable. Um, districts are required to provide um, the services to students and um, even with the lack of qualified special education staff, you know, districts are finding ways to still continue to provide those services with para educator support and even with general education um, teachers uh, because the state does allow a general education teacher or para educator to provide instruction to the students as long as the plan is designed and supervised by a fully certified special education teacher. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So my concern is that the word cap. Okay. Because to me that is an absolute and you can't go over it. So what you're saying is we're not necessarily looking at an absolute cap, but we're looking at guidelines on staffing ratios. Some call it caps, some call it ratios. Um, it's just used different terminology about it, but it, it's guidelines, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, do we have any other members with questions? Are we getting back to uh, Representative Paulette now? Thank you. Um, a slightly different aspect of this um, uh, looking at the recommendations in regard to um, support for developing the pipeline of educators for special education. The legislature has uh, created a conditional scholarship program and uh, for uh, certificated teachers in shortage areas, which were to include special education. And we've also um, done some programs for paraeducators. And um, my recollection uh, is that there were supposed to be reports to the legislature about how those were proceeding and whether or not we should be expanding the funding for those if they're successful. And my strong recollection is that when we created the conditional loan forgiveness program for teacher shortages, the Student Achievement Council reported that it had um, uh, in, like four times as many applicants from our teacher prep programs as we were providing support for, for qualified applicants. In other words, lower income who, uh, students who wanted to make a commitment to teach uh, for several years. Uh, do you, did you get to see any reports on the success of those programs and any detail about, uh, it seemed like you were saying, the report says we should be investing in them, but I didn't see detail about should we, have we inadequately funded them? Do we need to expand them? Are there additional new programs or other teacher prep programs or para prep programs that we should be expanding? The report is uh, talking, um, uh, th these preparation programs, alternative certification routes or grow your own programs have been um, implemented in other states with um, high success in helping like attract and prepare um, people to become a special education teachers. So it's um, definitely a strategy that is like highly recommended by national organizations and um, studies out there. Um, as far as Washington, we didn't, this study, this audit in particular didn't get like in depth into like how many um, alternative preparation programs are out there and um, what the successes have been. Uh, research, limited research that that I did on this study um, 
on the Professional Education Standards Board identify like 15 um, preparation programs, um, but OSPI, I recall OSPI also saying that there might be like 28 total preparation, alternative preparation programs. What we are hearing from the school districts is that these programs are not, and you can see this on the map on the Professional Education Standards Board website, they are not located everywhere, everywhere in the state. So, they're not accessible to every school district that might need them to help um, attract and prepare people. You may follow up. Um, thank you. Um, the, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but would it be fair to say that when we adopted some of these as pilot programs, your research shows that in other states, they are highly successful in actually increasing the number of uh, educators in special education, uh, which would should lead us to consider expanding, including where the uh, programs are offered. Is that a fair recap? When, uh, this is what the research says, when they include comprehensive coursework and a strong mentoring and support, they can be very successful in attracting and preparing people to become um, special education teachers. And based on the limited um, research on this study, we know what we know of is that there are some in Washington, but they're not available everywhere in the state. So a next step could be looking into like which areas they're not available that are needed. That is super helpful. Thank you very much. Representative Berg. We're just going in a circle today. So um, so I, I wanted to, the, maybe you might have answered this question within the body of the presentation, but the first thing that your audit results identified was that we don't know the full extent of the shortage in attrition. And so what I'm trying to grapple with um, is, you know, creating a laundry list of next steps for us as policymakers. And so that to me is just a glaring kind of red light of we need to get better data. And so do you have, are there embedded in here specific recommendations to um, attain better data on that? Um, because I think in terms of the shortage and attrition, understanding the full extent, I, you identified some great ways to, to um, increase retention and increase uh, recruitment, but how do we identify what that full picture looks like? And it sounds like we, we might be falling short in other areas of identifying lack, um, not just in our special ed teaching population, but in other parts of our teaching population, if I'm, if I'm reading this right. I can speak to the um, special education um, teacher population because that's the <clears throat> scope of this uh, study. So the U.S. Department of Education recommends that a state collect three data points to determine um, total long met need, critical shortage areas. It is the number of vacant on field um, teaching positions the uh, number of positions that are filled with uh, teachers that lack an endorsement in a special education, for example, and the number of positions that are filled with teachers that only have a limited certificate. When it comes to Washington, Washington um, has data on two of the three data points. Washington collects data on the uh, teachers who are providing special education services and lack an endorsement in special education or only have a limited certificate, but the state does not collect and analyze data on the number of vacant special education positions. So to get a full picture of the statewide shortage, um, that will be a, a data point um, that is needed and can provide a more complete picture. In terms of that the turnover, the, the attrition, what we found again on this study, like the only study we found only analyze the teachers who leave the profession, the special education teachers who leave the profession, and not those that move within and across, across the school district. So that's also um, additional analysis that can be done to get a more complete picture of the, the turnover, the attrition. I, I don't know if that answers your question, but there is a piece on the report where we, 
say, you know, that collecting these data could help the state better identify the school districts that have most, more severe staffing needs mm -hmm. in order to deploy resources accordingly to help those districts address that shortage. Yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. And uh, Mr. Chair, if I just may follow up. Um, so I guess for OSPI, um, is it sounds like, I guess I'm asking OSPI, do we need a bill? Do we need a rule? Like, how can we collect that extra data point? It sounds like there's three. We're collecting two of the three. What will take? What will it take to get us to collect that third data point to have a complete data set? Thank you very much on to that. So, why is it difficult to know about a vacancy? In part because when districts have a vacancy and they post a position, that's not information that is centralized on any kind of state source. That information about vacancy is, is a job posting posted on a district's website. It might be a Word document. It might be a PDF. It might not have anything you can download. So in order to identify vacancy, researchers and scholars even struggle in Washington State. How do we do this? And they've created complex web scraping strategies to go through district websites and identify which is which and pull these things down. So. Without a state job portal for teachers, much like you would see in Arizona, for example, uh, without some kind of state portal, it's really difficult to put any kind of pinch on what vacancy is. Not everyone in school districts, uh, in different school districts will agree, is a statewide job portal a good idea? Some people will say, and I've heard them say, no, we don't want uh, our teachers to know where they could get a better job, for example. Uh, there are other reasons someone might not want a statewide job portal. If if one exists, it is one way that you can find about vacancy. Um, I didn't see a chat here, but there is a there is an article I can share with you if, if any individual member or person is interested in looking up more about how have scholars here tried to identify what vacancy is and why is that short. So. Um, in short, it's a complex thing to assess in, in, in any way you go. Uh, if I were just making a hunch based on my own personal opinion and experience, I'd say a statewide job portal is one good idea to provide data to analyze this. And think about it like this. If I want to apply to a job and I only have to create one application or one resume and everybody can see it, that's great. If, the, if, if I am able as a district to get support in posting something where I believe people will see it, great. And, you know, I'll add one more point. Washington is a state that uh, attracts people. People want to move here. So if I wanted to find a job in Arizona teaching because I wanted to move to Arizona, it would be really easy for me to do that. It would be hard to do that in Washington because I'd have to know the different districts, websites. I'd have to know things I don't know. Uh, so with regard to recruiting more teachers who may come from out of state for all the benefits Washington provides, a job portal could help attract those individuals as well. Um, Mr. Chair, if I could just, I'll wrap it up. Um, you may follow up your follow up. Okay, thank you for the follow up. But and, and honestly, it was just a, a thank you for that explanation because that's very, very helpful. And then I think um, my office will just reach out to OSPI because I'd like to talk more about the connection of special education and our parent partnerships, which are robust and, um, and numerous in our state and that, that could be possibly an overlooked link. Um, and then to the statewide job portal, I just love more information. So thank you. So I, I will ask one more question, um, and it's regarding um, alternative pathways into the profession um, and, and the credentialing issue. Um, I don't know what the credentials requirements are to get in, so I don't know, but maybe you can fill me in on what aspects of those credentialing are keeping people from going into the profession. I mean, if I mean, who do we have out there for potential candidates that are saying, you know, the credentialing is keeping me from doing this? Uh, if you made this change, I would go into that profession, and so would a lot more uh, individuals. What is that, or what are those particular things that we need to look at as to whether or not to make changes to, or how to make changes to, to get? those people to say, okay, now I will. I get limited information on this area, but what I know, what I do know is that until recently, in order for a qualified teacher with an out-of-state endorsement to teach in Washington, they had to obtain a Washington certificate. 
Okay, I'm just going to interrupt for a second. That's great for people who already have certificates outside. Okay. I'm talking about people who are not currently cert certificated in any state and getting them through a credentialing process, getting them interested in becoming credentialed. Is there anything that people are saying out there, well, I would go and get my credentials except that? Because we can't just rely on people moving from other states to come here. We have got to start recruiting from our future workforce or our current workforce to, to get more people into this, into this profession. I don't, we don't have information on like people's perspective, but what, what I can tell you is that there is a cost and time into obtaining um, an education in a special education. These alternative routes to certification programs are more affordable and they are shorter. We're talking about one to two years compared to four years on a traditional program. So um, they do become a more attractive action for, uh, attractive alternative for people that maybe have another career but not in a special education, but want to change careers. Or for somebody that is already at the school, like a paraeducator or some other non-faculty uh, faculty staff that wants to um, enter the teaching profession. So they do become an attractive alternative um, because they're shorter, they're more flexible. And also, if it is a grow your own program, for example, when a school district is trying to like attract and hire somebody within their community. Sometimes the school districts will cover the cost of attending that alternative um, certification program and commit commit to hiring that um, person in the in the school. So they they are an attractive alternative in terms of cost, um, the time it takes to complete the program. So. I don't know if that answered your question, but cost, that, that time, is a deterrence. A Thank you. That did help quite a bit. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions? Not seeing any. Um, my understanding is we don't have any members of the public signed in to testify, uh, as we didn't on the previous uh, report either. Um, so with that, thank you. I uh, appreciate you taking uh, our questions. Um, sitting there through through all of these questions uh, and providing us with uh, with good information. So I appreciate that. Um, and with Thank that, you. we will close out um, this report. Um, I will, even though we don't have public testimony, I will remind um, the audience that anyone wishing to provide written testimony on today's agenda topics can submit comments to jlark at leg.wa.gov just remember a legislature Washington government. So jlark at leg.wa.gov, or you can send them to PO Box 40910, Olympia, Washington, 98504. Uh, written testimony will get uh, forwarded to all of the jlark members uh, and be available to the public on the jlark website. And with that, I believe we have no other business. I want to thank you, uh, thank the uh, State Auditor's Office for, uh, for your reports and answering our questions, uh, as well as agency staff who have been here today. And I want to thank the members and JLARC staff. And with that, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>